Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the security track for the afternoon session. So our first session of the afternoon is security and compliance for container-based microservices. Hopefully that's what you're here for. Uh, it's going to be Max Nuvians from the Canadian Digital Service and Nirmal Mehta from AWS. Please give them a warm welcome. All right. Good morning, everyone. Or no, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Nirmal Mehta, and you're here for security and compliance for container-based microservices. Is, is this the right session that you're supposed to be at? All right. I'm Nirmal Mehta. I'm an AWS Principal Special Solution Architect in the container space. And I'm joined today by, with uh, Max Nuvians from, and he's head of SRE at the Canadian Digital Service. Let's get into it. So today, uh, we would love for you to get best practices on container security. Is that what you're here for? Yeah, you wanna figure out how to secure those? Yeah, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start off with Max showing how they do container security at the Canadian Digital Service. And then it's gonna go back to me, and I'm gonna go dive a little bit deeper into the different layers of your stack with respect to containers and how to secure different areas of that environment. So there's three things I'd love for you all to take away today. First is get those best practices for container security. Second, understand your shared responsibility, right? So AWS has a shared responsibility model and what, what's your, what, you're, what you're responsible for and what we help with. And then third is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Now, there's no context to me just saying that, but we'll get to it later in the presentation. So just remember those three things. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Max to get started. Thank you very much, Nirmal. So thank you very much for having me here today and allowing me the pleasure to talk to you about container security at the Canadian Digital Service. So as Nirmal mentioned, my name is Max Neumanns and I'm currently the head of site reliability engineering at CDS. So, your, your first question might be, what actually is a Canadian digital service? So in my mind, we are uh, at the core, we are a change management organization disguised as a service delivery organization that sits at the very heart of government. Uh, and you may ask, well, what is your mission? And our mission is to empower government to serve people better. And how do we go about that? So we make accessible and inclusive services that work on any screen or device. We mainly deliver those through our platform business unit However, we also have a partnerships business unit that will work with other government departments directly to build these types of services. Let me give you a few more details about CDS. So the Canadian Digital Service was launched in July of 2017 to change the way government designs and delivers services. We are a sector inside the Treasury Board Secretariat of Canada, so part of the core government, and we are a fully distributed organization with employees from coast to coast to coast in 40 different locations. So a truly Canada-spanning organization. Let me talk a little bit about some of our products. So one of the products you may have heard about is GC Notify. And you'll heard of this if you got an email from notification.canada.ca at some point in your life. Um, GC Notify helps government departments send notifications such as email and text messages to people that use government services. Since November 2019, Notify, Notify has sent over 50 million messages and is in use by over 227 uh, programs and other services. So this is a really great example of how we help other government services because one of the hardest things to do in government is to procure an external service, and that is for a very good reason. Having a rigorous procurement process avoids things like corruption, but it also slows down delivery because you have to go through many gates and, and many uh, steps to, to get access to these services. So in the case of Notify, we provide an easy to use API for other government departments that has no procurement overhead, allowing them to go to market much faster than if they had to procure or build their own thing. So, and in this case, Notify is based on open source software that we had forked from the UK government and it currently runs as containers inside a Kubernetes cluster. The second big product that we had is COVID Alert. So this was until recently Canada's implementation of the Google Apple exposure notification framework. Uh, COVID alert was split into multiple parts, including a mobile app and a server component. The team I was part of primarily worked on the server component, and that is where we leveraged a lot of the things about containers that I will be talking about in a few minutes. However, during our deployment of the COVID alert server from summer 2020 to summer 2022, we did generate some very impressive data, and I'd, like to, I'd really like to highlight that here because I'm really proud of the team. And that includes 2.5 billion API requests, 
We, we sent over 150 terabytes of data through the wire. Um, we had 130 releases to production, so almost one every three days. And at, through all of those, the thing that I'm most proud of is we had zero downtime. Um, so let's talk about containers. So for folks who may not be unsure about what a container is, a container is a lightweight, standalone, executable package of software that includes everything needed to run application code. So the code, the runtime, the system tools, the system libraries, and settings. And so the first thing we need to talk about is why do we use containers in the first place? So as an organization, we decided that managing virtual machines to deploy our applications was beyond our ability to do in a safe, in a safe and consistent manner. Second, we can rely on the expertise and experience of a cloud service provider that is a lot better at running infrastructure. And so this is a great example of the shared responsibility model Nirmal was talking about in, uh, a couple of minutes ago. So the cloud service provider does, know, does what they know how to do best, which is to run these types of infrastructure, and we, know what we, we do what we know how to do best, which is to build accessible and inclusive services. So the next question might be, where, where do we deploy these container applications? And we deploy them into one of three managed services in our cloud. So the first one we deploy to is serverless, and in the case of AWS, because we are multi-cloud, uh, in the case of AWS, this is AWS Lambda. So the idea is that your container lives for a very short time, performs a short transaction, and then goes dormant again. Every time the function is invoked, it pulls a fresh copy of the container from storage, and it makes it unlikely that somebody is going to compromise or exploit your application because the, the hardware that the application uh, runs on is changes frequently and is ephemeral. Our second deployment target is a managed container platform like Fargate, uh, in which we can deploy one or more containers but have very little control over the underlying hardware or its provisioning. In terms of complexity, it is, a pretty lightweight, it is pretty lightweight and in our minds just a more permanent version of the Lambda, although their security models differ a little bit. And then lastly, uh, we deploy into a managed Kubernetes platform, like I had mentioned earlier about Notify, uh, which we use for more complex applications with multiple microservices. And if you have any experience with Kubernetes, day one with Kubernetes is amazing because you kind of just put all your stuff in there, it networks it, it makes it work, and you're, you're just amazed and blown away by what is really an, an, uh, a crazy technology, technological achievement. But then the second day, you kind of realize like, what you've bought into, and you realize that you have to you know, adjust container limits and things like that, and you just realize that the overhead of running things in Kubernetes is actually quite significant. Um, so for our purposes, because we have quite simple applications that do one or two things, we try to target AWS Lambda and Fargate versus necessary Kubernetes. So let's talk about security. And, and the idea more than just security is how to keep containers safe and avoid surprises. So for me personally, security isn't just about you know, somebody exploiting your containers and, and hacking into them, but it's also about how to keep uh, containers reliable and how to keep them safe and how to make sure you have zero downtime. So take, take the idea of security as like a, a bit of a larger scope other than just exploitation. Um, so my first recommendation for you, and I'm gonna go through a bunch of recommendations that we've learned at, at CDS. And a lot of these will seem simple or very straightforward, but for me, it's, it's really the things, the simple things that you have to get right. And so these are some of the recommendations I would like to give you that, that will lead you down that path. So knowing what is in your container is critical. You should know what dependencies you're putting into your containers. If one of them is vulnerable, your container may also be vulnerable. To avoid issues, you can, for example, scan dependency manifests with tooling. You can create automatic alerts when upgrades are available. You can even block releases if the, container contains, if the container contains critical vulnerabilities. Or you can generate a software bill of materials or an SBOM that you can use in other applications to clearly identify what dependencies you have. So on the right-hand side, a lot of you will be familiar with this, is a, is a dependency file that basically says what dependencies you're using and the versions that those dependencies have. So this makes it very easy for an automatic tool to go through that file and say like, okay, you know, I know that AWS CLI 1.2.3.4 is vulnerable, so please don't deploy this application because I know there's a known vulnerability in that dependency. The second recommendation is to use multi-stage builds if possible. And I know we're going into a bit of a more complex Docker uh, concept here. So what you're looking at is a Docker build file that defines how the container should be built. You can think of a container as a layer cake where different layers are built on top of each other. And this file describes how to build this cake. This is the Docker file for the CDS website, so which you can reach if you wanted to under digital.canada.ca which is just a, a bunch of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files, and a web server that we have written in Go. 
Because Go can compile static binaries that include all dependencies, all we need is the web server executable and the website source files. No other operating system files are required. So what we've done in this case is in the first part of the build step, we, we build the, 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 the Go binary, and then we copy that Go binary in the case of a multi-stage build. You take that output and you put it into the next build step, which is just an empty scratch container. So nothing is in there other than the Go binary and the static files to, uh, to complete the website. So there's no other system files, nothing that can be attacked, and so this significantly reduces the attack surface. The next recommendation I would have for you is to, uh, that your base image matters. So this is a comparison of three Docker containers that we have at CDS and their relative sizes. One thing uh, you might want to try and do is to make sure that you have them as small as possible. So the, the CDS website container I just talked about is only 50 megabytes in size, while our COVID-19 benefits finder application we built a couple of years ago is about 250 megabytes in size, and our notify image is about 440 megabytes in size. So these are all optimized for the applications that they're running in. Uh, they also each use a bit different base image. So Notify uses the Debian base image. Uh, the C19 benefits finder uses the Alpine base image. And as I just mentioned, the CDS website is just an empty container. It has nothing in it other than the web server and the static files. So going about this, as you're learning, going, uh, learning Docker, you may think, okay, well, you might be tempted to think about all the great features that come with a container base image because you're like, well, this container base image has all these great libraries, so then my application could use all those great libraries, but you know, this is really a trap. You have to do it the other way around. Uh, instead, think about what your application needs and then trim down your base image to exactly that specification, and that way you're gonna eliminate another uh, significant amount of attack surface on your container. Next recommendation that I have for you is to tag your containers with a Git shot. So hopefully most of you are using Git. Um, and this will allow you to know exactly what version of code you're running, and this is really important. What you're looking at in the top picture is a commit line uh, for Git with a change by a developer at CDS. In this commit, a developer at CDS fixed a JSON serialization error with the SQL Alchemy engine. On the right-hand side, you can see the seven-character abbreviated Git SHA that references this fix in the Git history. Uh, in the image below, you can see our continuous integration and deployment pipeline tagging a container image with that SHA exactly. This means that we know that the code inside the container contains all the code inside Git up at, oops, sorry. Let me go back, sorry about that. Um, nope, that's not back. Sorry about that. Uh, this means you can easily cross-reference what code is running in production to what we expect to be running. Even more important is that assuming something went wrong, we can very easily roll back to a previous version of the code where the developer's fix had not yet been introduced. So now assume that the latest release introduced a security, vul okay. security vulnerability. Well, okay. Let me go back. There we go. Thank you. Uh, now assume that your latest, uh, your latest release introduced a security vulnerability. This will allow you to qu quickly revert back to a version where you didn't have that vulnerability. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Um, next recommendation I have for you is to automate the build and deploy process. The less manual processes you have, the more consistent your security will be. Ideally, the only manual action is code review and approval to merge your work into the main branch of your code base. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the definition of a build pipeline where we first log into the Elastic Container Registry, then we build and tag the container, push the container up to the registry, and finally deploy the container to a Lambda. If we were to do all of this manually, or even with a runbook, where somebody is typing in the commands, then you're going to be in a lot more error prone than if this happens automatically. And so because the automation happens in the cloud, the only risk is there's no connection between the, where the processes are run and AWS, which is way beyond our control to begin with. So next recommendation is to design your system so that it can be recreated easily. So recommendation is use infrastructure as code to ensure you can tear down and rebuild your environment with as little overhead as possible. If a container is just a pluggable piece of that system, you're going to have a much easier time replacing and maintaining it. If something is easily replaced, then your speed to deploy will go up significantly. If, you, if your speed to deploy is high, then you will be in a much better position to address security issues. So what you're seeing on the right is part of our pull request workflow, where before we make changes to our infrastructure, we immediately see what changes are going to be made. And, this, and using infrastructure as, as, as code tooling has allowed us to become much more accurate and much more rapid in how we build and deploy processes. Next recommendation I have is actually check your container's functionality before you deploy. Many a time where we've deployed a container that wasn't viable. 
So in this case, you can use blue-green or canary release deployment strategies to ensure containers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. On the left, you will see a blue-green deploy pattern where traffic is slowly shifted automatically from the original version of the code to the new version of the code. If an error is detected, it automatically will revert back to the original version of the code. On the right, you're seeing a canary release pattern where we manually adjust the routing from one version of the code to another. In this case, we initially had a 75 to uh, uh, 25 split, and now we're uh, changing it to a 50-50 split. So half the traffic will go to one version of the code, half the traffic goes to the other. The difference in, is that in blue-green, you have two identical versions of the environment running, and the change happens over t time and very quickly, versus in, in Canary, you slowly roll out the changes to a subset of users. Uh, almost there. So the next recommendation I have is to keep a lookout for unusual behavior. So you can use a tool like falco.org, which can monitor, monitor system calls. Uh, when an alert does happen, you can track that alert both in the logs uh, and as well as other mediums like the Slack channel image above. So what you are seeing in the screenshot is our SRE, or Site Reliability Engineering Bot in Slack in action that allows us to call an instant right from the Slack user interface. So for example, some, we detect an exploit, we immediately call an instant, right, and, and investigate that instant. And that brings me to my last recommendations around secure, uh, container security, and these are, these are probably the most important. So if there's anything that you want to remember from this talk, there's all these other great tips that I just gave you, but this one's probably the most important one. So please set up alerts and action them. And when there is an alert, run retros when you have an incident. So, and please make it a blameless postmortem. So it's really, it's normal for things to break. Things are designed to break, right? Like nothing will live forever. So treat every incident as a learning experience. Document incidents as they happen in an incident report. Review every single incident report as a team. Incident reviews result in items being added to your backlog. And incident reports should, not be, available, uh, should be available to everyone. And we have the saying at CDS, uh, and this, this, this has actually happened, is like, it's not Jim's fault he deleted the database. It sh he should never have been able to de delete it in the first place. So what we're doing is we're taking away the responsibility from the individual and putting it on the organization because it's, it is in the organization's power to fix these issues. It's not always in the individual's power to fix these issues. And probably the next question that I'd like to answer is like, why is any of this important? Right? And like, we just went through a whole bunch of technical solutions to technical problems, but at the end of the day, we're not doing this for the technical solution's sake. Why is this important? So for, as an organization, we want to build uh, flexible, reliable, and secure services for Canadians. Uh, we want to be able to deploy applications quickly, responding to user needs as they arise, and we want to leverage best-in-class technologies that allow us to do more with less. And, the last part is really important. We, we want to build a psychologically safe and positive work environment where people can focus on the tasks that matter. People should not be scared to be making mistakes. And one of the ways that we can do that is by ensuring that the work they do is within like safe parameters and guardrails. So that brings me to the end of this discussion and uh, the talk. And this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any more questions. Uh, we'll be available after the, the talk as well. But if you have any questions, please send me a message or, or connect on, on uh, Twitter or through our website. Um, more than happy to talk about this uh, forever because this is one of my passion topics. If you would like to talk to CDS, this is our website and our Twitter, GitHub, and LinkedIn. Uh, more than happy to talk to anybody in government or outside of government about the work we do. Um, Thank you very much, really appreciate it. I'm gonna be handing it off to Nirmal now, who's gonna be talking about how these things are managed on the AWS side of things. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Thank you, Nirmal. Good job. All right, so uh, can we get another round of applause for Max and the awesome stuff that's happening? I, I, I wanna do a shout out to that zero downtime. Did anyone catch that? That was like a, a bit, was a billion requests and zero downtime. That is an incredible achievement, and it's a testament to the the work that Max is doing and and that blameless culture, right? Creating a safe psychological place that even if things fail and um, you know things go wrong, that no single person is blamed for that, and the organization learns and improves. That's a core foundational concept in security in general, and creates a reliable environment and a safe space for people to get their jobs done. So thank you again. All right, so containers. Why is the security of containers challenging? Well, it all comes down to the fact that containers run on a shared host. So that shared environment means that you, you have to 
consider the boundaries of the container. You have to consider what's inside the container, how the container is run, and the host that, it, that it's running on. On top of that, traditional security tooling that you're used to is not container aware. Now, this story has improved over the last few years, but when containers first came out, there was a lot of security tooling that was basically inapplicable to containers because they didn't know how to handle them. And then looking at what's inside the container becomes an additional challenge. And we're, so we're gonna go into how AWS thinks about container security, our shared responsibility between you as a customer and what AWS provides, and also some of the going into the different layers of container security in the next slides. So how should we conceptually think about security and especially container security? Well, a colleague of mine, Jeremy Cowan, in reInvent 2020 presented this slide, and it's, I love it. It's the onion model of defense in depth. Has anyone seen this before? Cool. So you start with, um, th think of this as, as like the layers of, of your infrastructure and your, your environment. And the different layers have the different concerns to mitigate the risk at each layer. And at the core of the onion, the center of the onion is your user data, right? So that's your business core data, and it it's, might contain PII or other sensitive information. And the gotchas there are data leaks, GDPR, policies, compliance. And that's, that's like the core of what we're trying to protect. Then you have the configuration of your system, the configuration of that environment, the configuration of that data. And some of the gotchas there are secrets, like passwords, API keys, who can commit to source, how, how does your configuration of your application look like? Then you have the actual application code itself. And the gotchas there are logs leaking. Um, you wanna, your concern space for risk mitigation is like static code analysis. That's where CI, CD pipelines and DevOps comes in. Then you have your dependencies, what your application depends on. This gets amplified within the container space because you can put a lot inside your container and those dependencies become multiplied with lots of containers running with different dependencies in them. So that creates a bigger surface area and you can have lots of different languages supported in your container environment. Then you have the actual container itself and the runtime of that container. So you wanna make sure that there's no unprivileged users running those containers. You wanna make sure that you're scanning those containers. And you wanna make sure that you know, they're sharing a kernel, so you wanna make sure that they, you know what the container is doing to the underlying host. And then you have the host itself. And these are the traditional concerns that we have with regular EC2 instances or VMs, which is patching, CVEs, uh, the compliance of that host, et cetera. So this is a good way of mentally understanding the surface area and securing each of these layers creates a defense in depth, right? So defense in depth is the cornerstone principle of a secure environment. So let's, let's dig into the onion a little bit. Let's start with container images. All right, so what did I say in the beginning? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. So with respect to container images, you wanna reduce the surface, the size and the surface area. You wanna reuse, you wanna make sure you create small base images that can be used within your organization and shared and are standardized and scanned, maybe officially supported. And you wanna recycle, you wanna start with vetted images and recycle them. You wanna think of them as ephemeral and just for purpose built. So your containers should be small and have a single concern. As tempting as it is to put that massive monolithic Java application into one container, plus, I don't know, some other Python scripts, plus, I don't know, your grandma's kitchen sink into that one container, don't. Reduce the surface area. The surface area of your container helps increase the security of your overall environment and make sure that you can focus on what exactly is happening in that container, and it's a good pattern with respect to the services that you're building. You wanna make sure that those containers are self-contained, no pun intended, right? They have one concern. Remove any unneeded binaries, et cetera. So how do you do that, Normal? Well, one way is to take a look at the image layers. 
I love the concept of the layer cake that Max mentioned. So a container is a layer cake. And um, if you run the Docker history command against a container image, you'll see the different layers. And you can see here, for example, you wanna watch what's happening in your layers. So um, you wanna make sure that unrelated run commands shouldn't be combined. And the corollary to that is that you wanna combine related run commands into one statement. Because each time you have a new line in Dockerfile, that's a new layer. And that'll increase the size unintentionally of your container image. Again, pointing out to Max's slide on multi-stage builds, that helps reduce uh, the layers, you can have a, a build file, a Docker file for, for creating the application or compiling the application, and then you have one for runtime. That, that is a very, uh, I, wa I wanna make sure I highlight that and from Max's talk, because that's a way to really reduce the size, and you, you took, that, took advantage of that at the CDS. Now, the next thing is, you wanna make sure that there's no cat hair in your layer cake, right? You wanna make sure that you lint it. So you can use a tool like HataLint to lint your Docker files. Linting means you're, you're just scanning the, the actual text in that Docker file and, and there's rules that, that apply to that to, that highlights certain areas of concern. So here we have some red X's on this Docker file. Um, can someone point out to me what, what, why, there's, why there's one of those red X's on there? Does anyone know? Yeah. Perfect, yeah, that's, that's the, the first one. So to repeat that, the from Debian doesn't specify a version. That's, a, that's not great because uh, by default you'll pick up the latest, so that means that your builds become non-deterministic from one build to another because Debian could have been updated in between you know, build one and build two. Another example is um, expose port 80,000. Can anyone here expose port 80,000 on a Linux host? Yeah, exactly. I, I hope, I, I'm glad no one raised their hand because that'd be impossible to do because the port's limit at 65,535, 65, right? So this is what linting does. It helps make sure you remove some of the initial uh, problem areas of your Docker files and, uh, right at the beginning of your, of your development process. The next thing to do with container images is you want a good registry. Now, Amazon has a great registry, Elastic Container Registry, which is a fully managed open container image compliant container registry. I'm gonna say container one more time in there. Um, it supports tag immutability, which means that you can set up the registry so that, uh, like we mentioned for Debian, if you had a con your container version with the Git SHA of, uh, what was it, like 1.8F or whatever it was, and uh, you try to push another one of that same exact Git SHA, 1.8F again, ECR will stop you if you set up tag immutability. And that's a good way to make sure that you're not overwriting and not uh, changing the determinism of your, of your container builds. It also supports encryption. So you can encrypt your ECR registries and the container images are encrypted behind the scenes. The next part, and this is crucial for container security, is the scanning of those images. Like we mentioned in the Onion model, you have the container itself and you wanna make sure you know what's inside that container. And since that has a potentially different operating system inside, you wanna make sure that you're scanning it with respect to vulnerabilities that might show up inside the container operating system. And in ECR, you have two types of scanning, basic and enhanced. The basic scanning allows for, it, you, under the hood, it uses the Claire open source scanning engine, and it covers the vulnerabilities in the operating system packages within your container. We also have enhanced scanning. Enhanced scanning is powered by Amazon Inspector, and it allows you to do continuous automated rescans of your containers as, you're, as they're being pushed into the environment. And not only does it cover the operating system like basic scanning, but it covers different programming languages from 50 plus different data sources with respect to vulnerabilities in common, you know, common programming languages and frameworks. And it's natively integrated into your security tooling that you might be utilizing in AWS already, like AWS organizations, Security Hub, and you can also hook it into Amazon AWS EventBridge 
for notification. So if there's new vulnerabilities that the scanner finds, you can alert your team, your, your central SRE team, you can email Max at the CDS, for example, to fix your containers. Um, you said it was, a, it, was a, it was a thing that you liked, right? <laughs> Just kidding, please don't do that. Um, and it's coming soon to AWS GovCloud US. So now you have all these container images. How do you manage them within your environment? From a security perspective, we want to recycle. So recycling means you want to support the control and reuse of that base container image that I mentioned previously. So you want to have a central team that creates a slim, as small surface area OS base image as possible. That's in the top right. That might be an SRE or DevOps team. It might be the CISO or the, the security organization that vets that base image. You want to make that as small as possible. And if that's not in your organization, ask why. Ask, figure out why, why that's the case and where those base images are coming from. The next step is that central team should create language and framework specific base images from, from that OS approved base image, right? So now you're adding just a little bit more for those specific languages. And a good starting point might be 80% of the, type, the typical programming languages and frameworks in your organization. From there, that central team now has a repository of a base OS image that's small and lightweight, ready to be used, recyclable, language and framework specific images. And those can be referenced within your CI CD pipelines for your application development teams. That, in this way, you have a recycled pattern where you're not just pulling in all kinds of random images from the internet as your base image and there's some control there, but you also maintain the flexibility of using the different languages, different languages and frameworks that you want in your application teams. Another way is to use GitOps. Now, GitOps is a more advanced technique. It's gaining a lot of popularity, especially within the Kubernetes and CNCF world. Uh, so in the GitOps model, it's a continuous operating model, and it takes GitOps consumes the CD, the continuous de de deployment part of the CI CD uh, concept. And in GitOps, the Git repo becomes the source of truth, not only for your application code, as it probably is now, but for all your infrastructure as code, manifests, Helm charts, and other artifacts. And then the tooling, the GitOps tooling, reconciles the source of truth in that Git repository to the infrastructure, and then, your application development teams, your security teams, and your CI pipelines reconcile what's in that source of truth by doing testing, building, and scanning of those, those sources. So you, it, it creates a very nice abstraction point, or in this case, immutability firewall, if you will, between these two uh, groups, the group that's managing the creation of these images and the creation of these artifacts, and then the infrastructure becomes way more automated. So if you're interested in this, check out the open source uh, tools called Flux and Argo CD, especially if you're in the Kubernetes world. All right, to recap, reduce, reuse, and recycle. So reduce, you want no secrets in your image. You want one service per container, per image. You don't wanna put the kitchen sink into that image, no SSH tools, Avoid debugging tools, all the other stuff that might be nice that your application doesn't really need, take it out of your image. Reuse, you wanna follow 12-factor app patterns with respect to your application development. These are vetted patterns, it's widely adopted, and there's a link in the top right to the 12-factor app pattern. And you wanna recycle. You wanna use trusted images that have been vetted by your organization, signed base images, Etc. All right, now we have our container images. Let's look at securing how they run. Secrets. Do not store secrets inside your container. I'm gonna repeat it. Do not store secrets inside your container. All right, I'm gonna like come up with an interpretive dance eventually. Do 
inject secrets into your container. Now, how do you do that? So you can use AWS Secrets Manager or Parameter Store. That they all have the capability of injecting secrets at runtime into your container for the, at the right time at the right place. So secrets in this case are things like your database password for your application to connect to RDS, for example. Well, in that case, you want to use you know, identity access management, service roles, and service, uh, service accounts. But if there's other secrets, um, like API tokens or, or other things that your application needs for that specific environment, inject them at runtime from a secure store. In the Kubernetes world, there's, AWS, uh, there's integration with AWS Secrets Manager. There's also a CNCF tool called External Secrets that you can use that you can integrate with different uh, secret stores like Vault and AWS Secrets Manager as well. Again, do not put secrets inside your container images, all right? The next thing is to limit container resources. So you wanna make sure that your container's blast radius, if something goes wrong, isn't consuming all the resources on the host. And this is a good practice with respect to reliability and observability, but also helps performance and security and helps with planning. This is an example below of how to do that in Kubernetes where you can limit the resource requests for a container. All right, this is super important. Do not run your containers as root. Do not run your containers as root. Do not run your containers as root. All right. <laughs> what is it? Do not run your containers as? All right, perfect. I'm done. I'm good. All right, so th uh, this is a, a big surface area uh, for container security, and just don't do it. If, you really, if your container really needs root and privilege escalation, first of all, triple check if it really needs it, and then do another check, because you need to have a really good use case for this. Um, some like build tools and other things might need to access the host, but just don't, don't run them as root if you can avoid it. This is a Kubernetes example of how to make sure that a container is not, does not have those privileges. Another way to lock down the capabilities of a container at runtime is using AppArmor and SecComp. So SecComp reduces the chance that a kernel vulnerability will be successfully exploited by limiting the system calls that the container can do to the kernel. AppArmor prevents an application from accessing certain files. So both of these tools allow you to limit what the application container is allowed to do. Again, reducing the surface area. An example of this is uh, like this Docker run command and in, in the Kubernetes example below is dropping all the capabilities, the system call capabilities of the container, and then adding only what's needed for that container. So in this case, it's dropping all and then it's allowing that container to bind to a service port. Dirty containers. If you have a container that someone has SSH'd into, first of all, why is there SSH inside the container, <laughs> right? Reduce. Second of all, that, that container is now what we would consider dirty. You wanna recycle your dirty laundry, I mean dirty containers, all right? That means that once someone has executed some code or SSH'd into it and changed that, you wanna consider it as dirty. The best practice is to remove, like, remove and recycle that container, destroy it. You wanna make sure that you reduce the amount of time that a container is, oh, is up and running with respect to dirty containers. And if you need containers for debugging and you're using Kubernetes, the latest version of EKS, Kubernetes version 1.23, has a concept of ephemeral containers. Take a look at those because they're a new feature and allows for spinning up in a, 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 lot, a short running container next to in, inside your pod for, for debugging or, or use. Much better pattern. Policy enable compliance. So in our, compl in, our compliant, in, in our compliant environments, policy is the boundaries in which we deliver our applications and infrastructure. And within the Kubernetes world, there's two use, useful open source tools for enabling policy enforcement. 
So we have Open Policy Agent and Caverno. Use some of these policy tools in your organization to enforce best practices, the best practices you've been seeing on these slides. Here's an example. Here's a Caverno uh, Kubernetes policy. And if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, don't worry. All you have to look at is the bottom part on the bottom left that says that there's a policy that allow, only allows a good registry or a very good registry. And if, what, if you apply this policy and you have a Kubernetes deployment that looks like the one on the right that has a bad registry specified, this policy will stop that pod and container from running in your Kubernetes environment. So this is a way, remember we had the base images and the central team and moving those approved images to the application team? You can use these policy tools to enforce that those uh, images only come from those approved base registries. You can also use CI's benchmark standards. There's open source tools to, to scan and, and look at the policy and the compliance of your environment. Take a look at these for your environment. There's ones for Docker, there's one for uh, Kubernetes, and there's also an Amazon EKS one. Now on the network side, this is, this is uneventful from, for most of the folks that are used to AWS, but you can use security groups around the container hosts, and there's EKS security groups for pods, and um, you can do network level pod policies for, uh, to limit unauthorized network traffic from and into your different egress and ingress pods. And the best practice is to do a deny all policy on any pods in a given namespace and explicitly approve network traffic to the proper e ingress and egress. And with respect to identity access management, for ECS, you wanna use task ex execution roles. And for EKS, you wanna use URSAs or IAM roles for service accounts. And for controlling API access, you just use IAM for ECS access and then use IAM and the Kubernetes RBAC for access to the Kubernetes control plane. All right, last part, container hosts. So now we've covered what the image, the container image, what's inside that image, scanning it. We've covered securing running those containers, right? Do not run as? Perfect, man, A plus. Um, now let's look at the hosts that these containers running, are running on. So again, same old spiel. Reduce the surface area of your host. Reduce or eliminate access, right? You wanna make sure these hosts are immutable. And you wanna recycle them. You wanna perform regular rolling upgrades of your host infrastructure, your compute infrastructure. And that's the, the added benefit is that you're testing a resilience and reliability of your underlying system. So you wanna make a, a if, you, if you are in an environment that requires custom AMIs, you wanna make a custom AMI that has a small surface area, and you wanna use that and rehydrate your container uh, infrastructure on a, on a regular basis. And instead of having SSH on those hosts, consider using something like Session Manager out of System Manager. Ideally, you should not need to SSH into any of your container hosts. They should be as immutable as the containers themselves. And if you have the chance, instead of using your operating, uh, operating system of choice, consider AWS Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket is a open source operating system developed by AWS that is purpose built for hosting containers. It has a reduced surface area. It's just, just what's needed to run the containers themselves and that's it. There's no shell, there's no SSH, and the binaries are built with the hardened flags. So consider looking at Bottle Rocket as the operating system of choice for your container hosts. More information there at that link. Host isolation techniques. What even better than using Bottle Rocket potentially or, or reducing the surface area of your, of your host is using AWS Fargate. Fargate is a serverless compute construct that we manage the compute uh, layer, sorry for hitting the mic. We, use, we uh, manage the compute layer for you and you just have to specify the, the pod and container and we'll spin up that infrastructure to host it. Now, 
And the last thing here is there are various third-party software solutions that cover containers, container security, from scanning images to runtime policies to incident response and forensics and securing your hosts. So don't, don't have to do it alone. AWS is here to help you with your shared responsibilities, and we also have these third-party partner software vendors. This is a limited set. There's a complete list at the AWS Partner Solution Finder online. All right, whew, that was a lot. My, my throat is actually like kind of parched right now, if you can hear that. So that was a lot of information. Thankfully, I wasn't expecting you to memorize it all, even though I had to, like five minutes before this talk. No, I'm just kidding. Um, get your phones out. So the, the right-hand QR code link is the EKS Best Practices Security Doc on, on GitHub. And the, no, the left-hand link is the EKS one. The right-hand one is the ECS Security Best Practices Doc. So I'm gonna leave this up for a couple more seconds so that you guys, y'all can, uh, can take a look at that. Actually, I, I do expect you all to remember, remember something. What was it again? Do not run as? All right, reduce and recycle. All right, I'm gonna do that again. Reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? Reduce your surface area, reuse your images, and recycle your hosts and containers, all right? We encourage you all to get engaged with our training and certification content today. As you build your skills, especially around security, consider preparing for one of our 12 AWS certifications. These industry-recognized certifications span foundational, professional, and specialist specialty levels to validate AWS knowledge and skills, building your credibility and confidence. Scan one or both of these QR codes on the screen to get started with your cloud skills training and certification today. All right, now I hope you, I hope you all get some great best practices from today's session, things that you can implement today in your organization or tomorrow, it's kind of late in the day, um, tomorrow in your organization for securing your container workloads. And you remember reduce, reuse, and recycle, and the amazing stuff that Max is doing at the CDS. And with that, I hope you had a great session today and a great rest of your day. <laughs>